Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. This is a real, I'm inspired to hear you today. I hope you guys have some tissues ready. I don't want us to leave ever the same. Let, let today not be a jacuzzi experience where you feel good while we're here. This is the house of transformation. Be transformed in your mind, in your heart, in your soul today. But that means you have to listen, put your phone on airplane mode, don't be distracted. The devil's gonna do whatever he can to distract you because if you can miss that thing that hits your heart, to open your heart, to be a part of the change, then the devil wins. Silence the noise of the enemy. It's just 45 minutes, quiet it, and watch what God can do in your life. You guys ready for me? Let's watch this video and then Seth Gruber is going to get up here and tear the roof off. Come on. If our country is going to deny the natural right to life to an entire class of human beings, we cannot trust that government to protect any other rights. So Christians have to care about this issue, firstly, because we're called to. These are little babies Amen. created in the image of God. Secondly, if we don't get the right to life right, we will be surrendering every other one of our rights that flow from that first and most important of all rights. You think God doesn't care about children? You think God doesn't care about babies? You think God's not pro-life? Pure and undefiled religion is this, care for orphans and widows in their distress. How much more does God care about the unborn whose life is in danger because his parents want him dead? Satan doesn't care what name you call him. Today, he's happy if the culture of death dubs him the name self, education, money, and career well-being. As long as you continue to shove children down his throat, he will say yes and amen, for he is the God of the religion of secular progressivism. We are not contending against an alternative politics, brothers and sisters. We're contending against an alternative religion. Roe versus Wade said that unborn human babies may be human, but they're not persons. The uh, pro-aborts yesterday, interestingly, were not at the March for Life at all. They didn't show up at all. We had 200,000 people marching for life, but they are here today with an abortion dancing flash mob dancing for the right to kill babies through point of birth. What, what's in the womb if it's not a human being? It's a fetus. That's right. what's in. Fetus is a Latin word for small child. <laughs> it's a Latin word for small child. <laughs> so do, do, how, how about you, since you don't think she can speak for herself? Do you, do you agree with Margaret Sanger? She's doing a great job. A fetus is not a baby. Abortion is not murder. Women are not incubators. So, so when did you become human? I told you, everybody hates abortion. Nobody you wants to have one. People don't I dance and cheer for something women. they hate. We're starting to wake up and realize that the culture wars was always just a proxy war for the spiritual war. These are proxy attacks against the sovereignty and kingship of Jesus Christ. If someone only got an abortion because it was a girl and they wanted a boy, is there anything wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it. It's up to the woman. It's her body. Yes. Really? So you yes. support gender side? I the elimination support, of preborn women I simply support, because of their gender. I support women making choices over their own bodies. How could you defend that as an advocate of women's rights? Killing baby Don't girls because they're because Don't they're girls? I woman. thought you were an advocate of women's rights. This is the sacrament of secular progressivism. This is the sacrament of Satan, and it's Satan's pride and joy. And his hunger for blood will never be satiated. Good morning. Hey, you're here. <laughs> Good morning. It's an exciting time to be alive because the lion of the tribe of Judah is on the move. He is stirring all men's souls. To quote Winston Churchill, the man who saved Western civilization, he's drawing them from their firesides, from their comfort, from their wealth, from their pursuit of happiness, to respond to impulses at once awe-striking and irresistible. And when the Spirit of the Lord is on the move, his sons and daughters ought to meet him on the field of battle. This is a Kairos moment that the church is living in right now. Do you sense it? Does it feel like this is a different kind of moment that the church and the country is in? And that's because not all moments in time are created equal, are they? Some moments carry more weight. 
some moments are more significant. We call this a kairos moment. Right? It's different from chronos, like, you know, church started at 11. That's chronological, right? No, 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 kairos. Kairos means Ron DeSantis knows what time it is, baby. Jurgen Matisius knows what time it is, baby. Charlie Kirk knows what time it is, baby. Jack Hibbs knows what time it is, baby. Pastor Rob McCoy knows what time it is, baby. Pastor Matt and the entire team here knows what time it is, baby. And I'll prove it to you. When I tell you 1850 America, what do you think of? Oh, someone said slavery. Oh, you narrow-minded, single-issue voting Republicans. Why did you think of slavery when I said 1850 America? You know, women didn't have equal voting rights in 1850. Why didn't you think of that issue? And you would say, well, Seth, <laughs> while many issues are important, they don't all carry the same moral and spiritual weight. Right. When I tell you 1940s Germany, what do you think of? The Holocaust. Hitler. Why did you think of that? You know there were brothels and sex trafficking going on. Well, you don't care about those women, church? And you would go, no, 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 I, I care about that as well. But I mean, it was the Holocaust, Seth. I mean, while many issues are important, they don't all carry the same moral weight. And I'm here this morning to tell you that abortion is not just one issue among many for the theocracy of secular progressivism. It's not just one issue among many for the spirit of the age and his obsession with killing babies. It is the centerpiece, the sacrament of secular progressivism. Because abortion says, you must die so I can live. But Christ says, no, I must die so you can live. I die and I'm raised from death. So you can too now repent and believe the gospel and come into the great commission. That's always been the invitation. So isn't it funny that the people who say like, I'm not, I'm not religious. I'm an atheist, right? I'm a, I'm a secular humanist. I'm not really religious. And, and people tell me, Seth, why are, you, why are you always talking about religion? Why are you saying that like secular progressivism is an alternative religion? Because it is an alternative religion. It functions often more dogmatically and religiously than many Christians actually do. And let me prove it to you. Bernie Sanders, two years ago, at the climate catastrophe town hall, he says one of the solutions to uh, overpopulation and climate change is to fund abortions in, in uh, poor black countries. He actually said this on national television, and you kind of go, you go, wait a second, that's kind of weird, isn't that? Because it was talking about climate change. What's that have to do with abortion? Because the left has always said that we have this problem with too many people. Are you aware of this, by the way? The secular progressive moral revolution has been obsessed with this idea of overpopulation, what they call the population bomb, for like years and years and years. And so, so their solution has been, well, there's too many people, and too many people are harming the environment. The environment being harmed causes climate change. So the sun god's really angry. <laughs> and so we need to sacrifice the babies in order to curb overpopulation to love the environment so that the sun god doesn't get angry. angry. Yeah, that sounds like the Aztec... The Aztecs in 1484 at the Temple Mayor at Tenochtitlan, where they ritually sacrificed 4,000 people over a two-day period, and they would take knives and they would slice open the chest of their victims, tear out the heart, and lift it up. There were historical accounts of this, by the way. I'm not just like pontificating. And they would hold it up to their sun god, Witzelapokli. I've done research on all this. Okay, I'm a student of history, so just take my word for it. Witzelapokli was their sun god, and their belief was that Witzelapokli was fighting a constant war against darkness, and if he ever lost that war, the world would be plunged into a cold, cold darkness and everyone would die. But Witzelapokli demanded humans and blood and human sacrifice to satiate him, <laughs> to, to, to fill him up with the energy to fight his war against darkness. How is that any different from George Soros and Bill Gates and the David and Lucille Packard Foundation and the entire secular moral revolution today who says we have too many people so we have to sacrifice the babies so that the sun doesn't get angry and so it won't cease to move across the sky and plunge us into a cold, cold darkness and everyone will die. And you're like, hey, maybe the culture war was really just a proxy war for the spiritual war. Maybe the spirit of the age, you Use the spell of the Johnson Amendment to castrate the church and the shepherds with the demonic lie that there's a separation of church and state. Uh, people told me this on Facebook. I get all this hate, of course, on social media. I was like, can you show me in the Constitution where it says separation of church and state? It's like, oh, right, it's not there. That, that was so that the state wouldn't create a state church, not that the church or Christians should be disengaged or prevented from seeking to influence secular governments for God's purposes. And so we're living in a Kairos moment right now. Let me prove it to you again. In the last two years, I have spoken in more pulpits, individual churches on the issue of life than in all 10 years of my speaking career. And I got to tell you how blessed 
and encouraged I am by this church and by Pastor Rob McCoy, my pastor, and Jack Hibbs and so many others, because I got to tell you, I've been a pro-life activist since I was a fetus. I've been sassy since conception, baby. And because my mother was actually the director of a pregnancy resource center while pregnant with me in 1991 when I was born in Azusa, California. And I've been told her body, her choice, that all parts of the baby are really just parts of the mother. Therefore, according to the religion and philosophy of secular humanism, it was just my mother's body. So if she was saving unborn children from abortion while leading a pregnancy resource center, it was actually me doing it because I was part of her body. That's what I've been told by very reliable sources. So follow the science, you stupid rubes. It was me saving unborn children as a fetus. So this has been a part of my life the whole time. But the reason why I said this was for this reason. You know how hard it's been for me to get into pulpits? Do you know how many years I was so discouraged and disgruntled and depressed by churches and pastors who, far from not giving me the pulpit, they weren't even preaching on the issue of life. And they say, we don't do politics, Seth. And I say, no, you refuse to preach against false religion that masquerades as politics in order to keep the politically impotent pastors silent. The spirit of the age has used just politics as probably the singular, most damaging and effective weapon to silence the pulpits. Reminds me of what Martin Luther once said, if I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that one point, at which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking. I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christianity. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proven. And to be steady, to be steady on every other battlefield is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that one point, that one point at which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking. Brothers and sisters, there are many important issues, and I'm not here this morning to tell you if God's placed a burden on your heart for another justice cause that you need to abandon that and come fight abortion. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, while many issues are important, they don't all carry the same moral weight. And for the secular moral revolution and the Democrat party today, abortion is the sacrament. It is is the centerpiece, it is actually the hinge upon which secular liberalism swings. And they understand that without abortion, they have nothing. Did you see some of the activist media chirons and headlines following the overturning of Roe versus Wade? They were saying things like, the GOP is just getting started. They were saying things like, they're coming for all of our rights. They were saying things like, now they're coming for interracial marriage. It's like, <laughs> and Clarence Thomas is sitting on the Supreme Court like, <laughs> You know, he's married to a white woman. Her name is Jenny, and he's the most based pro-life Supreme Court justice. Yes, CNN, I'm sure Clarence Thomas is coming for his own marriage. But do you see what they were saying? Don't miss it. It was a very important lesson. Perhaps the most important following the overturning of Roe versus Wade was the reaction of the spirit of the age and his acolytes by saying, oh no, now that they're tearing down the high places of Moloch, Every other priority we have is now compromised. Right, wake up, they're telling you that that's their centerpiece. Secular liberalism is literally built on the foundation of 65 million mutilated babies since 1973. Which is why Jane's Revenge and Ruth sent us two pro-abortion domestic terrorist groups began burning down, defacing, and vandalizing pro-life ministries after the leak of Roe v. Wade and the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and were writing on the walls of pregnancy centers across this country spray-painted words that said, if abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either. Wow. Wow. Now, I'm sure you know that the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security and Merrick Garland, they're taking that, those, those threats of domestic terrorism very seriously. <laughs> Uh, no, but when I spoke at a school board meeting last year, and I called the school board, you degenerate, pornographic, Alfred Kinsey-inspired demons putting porn in sex ed for minors, I was labeled a domestic terrorist by Attorney General Merrick Garland. But if you burned down pregnancy centers and pro-life groups, oh, and then the summer of love of 2020, the slightly fiery but mostly peaceful summer of love, 
All of that's fine, and Kamala Harris tweets out a donation link to raise money to pay the bail for the actual domestic terrorist groups. Does it feel like we're living in la-la land? Does it feel like we're through the looking glass? Does it feel like Alice is here in Wonderland? Here's why. Because of our toleration of child sacrifice. Those who murder the unborn cannot be trusted to govern the born. And those who murder the unborn will one day murder you as well. And I'm not saying this to rile you up into a frenzy. I get crit criticized all the time by, you know, apolitical, I'm neither left nor right, winsome Christians like Russell Moore, Ned Stesser, and Tim Keller, who wait downstream to pick up human heartache that they helped create through their political apathy upstream, to quote my pastor, Rob McCoy. And these people criticize me. They say, you're being so hyperbolic, Seth. Why are you riling people up into a frenzy? Because I actually believe it's true. Because I believe the longer we tolerate child sacrifice, the sooner they will find a new victim class to label unwanted. Undesirables, unfit. The Nazis had a term for that. It was Lebensunwertensleben. Translated, life unworthy of life. Which is why the White House, two weeks ago, by White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre, said that the greatest threat, I'm quoting verbatim, to freedom and democracy in America today is ultra-MAGA Republicans and pro-lifers. Did you know that in 1960, most Democrats were pro-life? So if you just believe what most Democrats believed in the 1960s, according to the White House, you are the greatest threat to freedom and democracy, and they are labeling us domestic terrorists. Brothers and sisters, can I submit something to you this morning? You don't label your political opponents domestic terrorists unless you plan to see them treated as such. Which is why Mildred Jefferson, the woman who turned Ronald Reagan pro-life, Mildred Jefferson, the first black woman to graduate from Harvard Medical School, you don't know her name because the left hates black people that think for themselves or are pro-life. You know this, right? Yeah, of course. Okay, good. You're, the, you're a woke church, right? You know what's going on. Right? Mildred Jefferson said, today it is the unborn child. Tomorrow it is likely to be the elderly or those who are incurably ill. Who knows but that a little later, it may be anyone who has political and moral views that do not fit into the new distorted order. We have been there for quite some time now. They're not labeling us that in order to test your reactions. They're labeling that to see how soon they can get to a political climate in which full-blown discrimination and Bernie Sanders gulags are being called for by the secular society to throw those Christians into at least the Christians who represent a threat to their political regime. Christians who have the spirit of Jonathan and not Lot. Mm, what do I mean by that? Come on. <laughs> what did he mean by that, Pastor? Huh? Well, let's talk about that. God gave me this insight recently as I was preparing for this White Rose Resistance National Life Tour sponsored and promoted by Charlie Kirk and Turning Point Faith to wake up the church for Christian resistance in this late hour of the culture of death. Jonathan and Lot, Jonathan and Lot, Lot and Jonathan, polar opposites, antonyms, biblical opposites of how to engage the culture. 1 Samuel 20, it's the, uh, tw 1 Samuel 20 or 21, it's a story, remember when Saul's trying to kill David again? And Jonathan, his best friend's like, no, he's not going to kill you. He, he, he runs everything by me. And, and David's like, Jonathan, no, <laughs> get woke, wake up. Your dad's trying to murder me. And so Jonathan's like, okay, I'll test it out at the dinner table, at the royal table. And, 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 then, and then you go to your city and say that you're there for a sacrifice. And so I'll, I'll give that excuse to Saul. And so then, therefore, he won't wonder why you're not there. So they test this. And then he says, I'll test it with my father. And then, and then you go hide behind a rock. And then I'll have a young man shoot arrows. And if he shoots the arrows past you, um, then get the hell out of here. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and if I shoot it right by you, then you're safe to come back. Uh, so that's how I'll communicate to you whether Saul intends to kill you or not. And so they miss swear an oath to protect one another. And David swears to Jonathan that if he comes to the throne, or Jonathan makes David swear, hey, once you're king, don't forget me. <laughs> right? Have you noticed that like, new political administra administrations tend to target the prior one? Yeah, so that was happening then too. And so they make an oath to one another. Well, man, Mike Lindell, 50 Republicans just got raided by the FBI and had their phones taken. Wake up. No crimes were alleged. No subpoenas were issued. No lawyers were called. They just showed up to these Trump-associated allies and legislators and took their phones and raided their homes. This just happened two weeks ago. 
Steve Bannon just blew the whistle. Charlie Kirk, you need to know what's going on. So, he, so, he, so then Saul's like, okay, he's not here. And then David's not at the dinner table the next day. And so Saul goes to his son, Jonathan. He goes, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. You have chosen that son of Jesse over me. Because Jonathan understood that God was raising up a man in that season for his purposes. You have to understand, Jonathan was forced to make a decision between the world and his position and what God was doing in the man that he was raising up for his purposes. Jonathan had a place at the table. He had cultural respectability. He was in the royal palace. He had servants. He had a pretty cush lifestyle. But he sacrifices all of that to stand for what God is doing and the man that God is raising up. Brothers and sisters, we have too many Christians today who would rather maintain their comfortable Christianity and continue getting crumbs from the worldly leaders, 501c3 status, than being more committed to what God is doing in the public square at this Kairos moment as he calls his sons and daughters to contend for the rights that we've taken for granted and will no longer contend for for the next generation. Jonathan has to decide between his life, his posterity, and his kingdom, or the kingdom of God and what God is doing and what God is building. And he gives it all away because he says, that son of Jesse. And God is bringing the savior of the world through that lineage. So you know what, Daddy Saul? Screw you. I'm going where God's moving because I owe an account to him for my life and the stewardship of what he's given to me. We have had the spirit of Lot and not the spirit of Jonathan in the church today. Lot, the biblical opposite of Jonathan. Remember Lot? Now, interestingly enough, brothers and sisters, did you know the Bible describes Lot as a righteous man? It's very interesting. Okay. Well, when the angels come to Sodom and Gomorrah to torch that city to Timbuktu, where is Lot? At the city gates. Lot was, n- was n- none other than the Christian influencer of his day. He had a position of authority. He had a place at the table. He had cultural respectability. He had influence over political leaders, just like Jonathan. But what does Lot do when the world and the devil are attacking at one area? He flinches. So the angels go to Lot's house, remember? He takes them to his house. And then what does it say? Men from all parts of the city came to his home. So every part of culture comes descending onto that righteous man's home. Does it feel like the secular, sexually obsessed, craved demonic society is coming down onto the church and saying, celebrate us, approve of us, tolerate us? Which is why in California, Newsom may be days away from signing a full-blown infanticide bill, which would prevent prosecutions and investigations to abortionists and women who even allow their babies to die up to 28 days after birth. I don't have time to get into the description. Go subscribe subscribe to my podcast, Unaborted with Seth Gruber, because we're all unaborted, and we break down all of these things. But they're literally pushing infanticide right now, and California Democrats just tried to make the church include coverages for abortifacient contraceptives in their healthcare plans. Again, after the court struck it down a few years ago. Does it feel like the secular society is descending on the church and saying, that one institution that could pose a threat to our political regime? That's why they label you domestic terrorists and ultra-maga Republicans, whatever that means. So Lot believed the truth. Lot even spoke the truth, but he wouldn't stand for the truth. He wouldn't lay down his life and die on the mat for the truth. And so he goes out to his porch when literally all of Sodom is coming to his home. And what do they say? Hey, Lot, bring those men out that we might have sex with them. Do you remember this story? I'm not embellishing that. This is like crazy kooky stuff. You understand why God wanted to torch the city now, yeah? Okay. Now, they weren't men. They were angels. So this culture is literally saying, hey, Lot, we want, come on, we want to sleep with the angels. And Lot believed the truth and he spoke the truth. He goes out onto his front porch and he says, brothers and sisters. (laughs) So he tries to relate to the sexually obsessed secular society. Hey, I'm a brother like you. I'm a sister like you. It's like Rick Warren, you know, Ed Stetzer, Russell Moore, Lecrae, Jackie Hill Perry. Like, do I need to continue? Hey, I'm just like you, man. Come on, like me, like me, like me. It's like, bro, they're trying to sleep with angels. They're not your brothers and sisters, okay? And so Lot says, but do not do this wicked thing. So yes, he he was willing to speak the truth, wasn't he? He called their actions wicked. And then what does Lot do? Hear 
are my daughters. Have sex with them instead. You see, Lot was saved, but he wasn't salty. So his wife becomes in death what he should have been in life. A pillar of salt. We are called to be salt and light and to preserve something that matters to God in the culture and to stand for and be willing to die for the truth because our Savior has a name and it's the way, the truth, and the life. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, you can be saved but not salty and you can make it into the kingdom by the hair on your rear (laughs) by grace and grace alone, amen? amen? But you wasted everything you were called to be a steward of. The horrors of the 20th and 21st century are nothing more than the spirit of Lot instead of the spirit of Jonathan in the church. We have given our children and our posterity over to the sexually obsessed, secularly humanistic society in order to remain relevant, to not be reviled, to make Christianity attractive, to keep our place at the table. So let's talk about the horrors of the 20th and 21st century, how we got here. You know, it was providential. Pastor Matt said something earlier, and I was like, whoa, that's providential that he said that. He said, weeds grow through neglect. And it was perfect because that was the intro to my message this morning. What false demonic ideas have been being planted in the soil, the weeds that have grown And the victims of those bad ideas, because the church wasn't there weeding out the bad ideas and planting good, godly, righteous ideas so that they will bring forth a beautiful fruit and harvest a hundredfold when the church is more committed to stewardship and truth than our reputation and making sure our leftist friends still like us. So what are the weeds? How did we get here? And what was the long walk through the institutions that secular moral revolutionaries were very patient and committed to in order to upend society and recreate it in their own image? Do you understand that ideas have consequences? But bad ideas have victims. And that's perhaps no more true today than on the issue of abortion. I would submit to you that most of the American church does not know the causes of the societal, moral, and spiritual decay happening in our country. We do not understand the ideology of the enemy, nor the people that the enemy of our souls has used to advance his ideology. We have been fulfilling G.K. Chesterton's prophetic line when he said, unless a man becomes the enemy of an evil, he will not even become its slave, but rather its champion. I know you have to stew in that a little bit. Huh? Like, people are like, hmm, I think I got what he said. They say, unless a man becomes the enemy of an evil, he won't even become a slave of the enemy he tolerates. He will become its champion. What is Chesterton saying? There's no such thing as moral neutrality. That sounds like Bonhoeffer. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. God will not hold us guiltless. And the longer you tolerate an evil demonic agenda that seeks to wipe out the image of God in the womb and target anyone who would stand against that sacrament of leftism, the sooner you will find that you have become an advocate of the very evil that you oppose linguistically. You oppose with words, like Lot, who calls their actions wicked, but won't stand for the truth that he espouses linguistically. In this late hour of the American culture war, I want to return to those things we used to know. I want to teach you, inform you, and equip you before it's too late, before Hosea 4, 6 is fulfilled again. My people are destroyed for lack of of knowledge. We do not know how we got here and the people that Satan was using to upend society. So let's begin with one person probably more significant than any other in the 20th century for one reason and one reason alone. While we have appropriately dismissed 
and critiqued the moral revolutionaries behind eugenics and genocide, there is one pontiff of progressivism, there is one high priest of progressivism, there is one patron saint of feminism who has led to far more bloodshed than any of the communist regimes of the 21st century, except this woman is praised in the halls of Congress. This woman is given awards in her name to Hillary Clinton. This woman is celebrated as a great defender of women's rights, and her name is Margaret Sanger the founder of an organization called Planned Parenthood, one of the most disgusting euphemisms ever. They don't plan parenthood, they eliminate the children of parents. Who was Margaret Sanger? I think we need to understand this woman and the intellectual, spiritual tradition she's in if we're to understand how we got here and why those who would stand against the slaughter of babies are now also being described as unwanted, undesirables, and unfit. Margaret Sanger was a communist revolutionary socialist in New York City in the early 1900s. She didn't just care about abortion or birth control, she cared about all of the creeds and tenets of progressivism. But she understood that to upend a society and to lead to a social revolution, you had to have a sexual revolution. Because you had to break down sexual and moral inhibitions and mores in order to make people more manipulatable and more likely to sit back and do nothing as the broader communistic regime was implemented in the culture. So the, social, the sexual revolution must precede the social revolution. The attacking of those values, those Judeo-Christian premises that built this republic. So you need to understand, Margaret Sanger was not just the abortion gal. She hobnobbed with all the socialists in the old New York labor movement in the early 1900s. She was radicalized by them and published her first paper called Woman Rebel, Woman Rebel, with the slogan, No Gods and No Masters. Okay, so wake up, understand, it's an alternative religion. It's the deification of the self. That was her first paper. <laughs> I'm my own God, essentially. Right, the first lie in Genesis 3. Eat the apple, do it my way, and ye shall be as gods. So she begins to publish sexually titillating, lewd material throughout the American postal system and publishing these things, breaking the Comstock laws at the time, which allowed the post office to actually go through and take out the sexually lewd material in order to protect a healthy culture and society. Right? It, was just the, the, it was just really the prerequisite of what became porn and the, the, the sort of social phenomenon praising and acceptance of this lewd material that breaks down inhibitions and causes addictions. And so she was indicted on three crimes, and so rather than being arrested, you know what Margaret Sanger did? I'm giving you the beginning of what became Planned Parenthood. Listen to this. Listen carefully. She ships off her children to be raised by someone else. She has her socialist friends in the New York labor movement forge her a passport, and she flees to England. She spends a year and a half there getting more radicalized than she was in New York, and she meets the Neo-Malthusians. Okay, so I'm giving you her friends, her influences, her mentors. Who were the Neo-Malthusians? Well, it refers to a man named Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus was none other than the Fauci of the 19th century. <laughs> he was a kooky, weirdo scientist who masqueraded his very weird philosophical, anthropological, dangerous views of personhood as just the science. <laughs> okay. And Thomas Malthus believed that food production cannot keep up with population growth, with the inevitable result being massive starvation, everyone will die. Back to that po the population theories of, do we have too many people? That really started in a major way with Thomas Malthus. So Neo-Malthusians believe that you have to d suppress population growth, which then leads to the question, well, who? <laughs> right, and it tends to be the poorer and darker of skin or the mentally and physically defective. That's, that's who Thomas Malthus is. Let me give you one quote from Thomas Malthus so you understand who Margaret Sanger's best friends and mentors were. Okay, Thomas Malthus. All children born beyond what would be required to keep up the population to a desired level must necessarily perish unless room can be made for them by the deaths of grown persons. Now notice, it's very funny. They never volunteer themselves to be Hillary Clinton suicided. Like if we have a population problem, like why don't you start with yourself, Bernie Sanders, you degenerate communist. But no, it's, it's always the darker of skin and the poorer people, which should give away the whole agenda. Like prove your own convictions, right? Don't fly in the private jet, suicide yourself. If we have a problem with overpopulation and the environment and climate change and the sun god with Silipokli, right? So, okay. He says, therefore we should facilitate instead of foolishly and vainly endeavoring to impede the operations of nature in producing this mortality. If we dread the too frequent visitation of the horrid form of famine, we should encourage other forms of destruction, which we compel nature to use. Instead of recommending cleanliness to the poor, we should encourage contrary habits. In our towns, we should make the streets narrower, crowd more people into the houses, and court the return of the plague. 
In the country, we should build our villages near stagnant pools and particularly encourage settlements in all marshy and unwholesome situations. But above all, we should reprobate specific remedies for ravaging diseases and restrain those benevolent but much mistaken men and women, all of you, who thought they were doing a service to mankind by projecting schemes for the total extirpation of particular disorders. Okay, if that's weird high language, here's what he means. Some people are good and some people are bad. We need more of the good people and less of the bad people. The bad people are typically poor and physically and mentally defective and darker of skin. And so, oh, and all you Christians with your 501c3s and ministries of mercy who try to love the poor and the disadvantaged and the oppressed, you stupid ultra maga domestic terrorist rubes, Darwinism just allow the survival of the fittest to take place. So stop with your cures to diseases and your encouraging of neighborhoods. Those people need to necessarily perish because I mean Charles Darwin, right? So this is Thomas Malthus, influenced by Charles Darwin, the neo-Malthusians who tried to accomplish his agenda with Margaret Sanger hanging out with all of them in England, okay? But she meets someone else named Havelock Ellis. Have you heard of Alfred Kinsey? Okay, good. You're a truly woke, informed church. Right? My people suffer for lack of knowledge. You guys are very informed. Praise God. Love you guys. Okay, so go, if you don't know who Alfred Kinsey is, go do your research. Subscribe to my podcast, Unaborted. We talk about him. Well, Havelock Ellis was none other than the English alternative of Alfred Kinsey. He wrote over 50 books on every form of lewd, sexual, degenerate behavior. He was impotent himself, so he's always trying to find new ways to get excited. And he had a very, very strange affair with Margaret Sanger. I'm not kidding. Margaret Sanger had an affair with Havelock Ellis while someone else was raising her kids while she left her husband in New York. So this is the beginning of Margaret Sanger. Testing? Oh, good. And so... Havelock Ellis begins to mentor Margaret Sanger, saying you need to tone down your more extreme sounding themes of anarchism and communism and focus on the more scientific sounding themes of eugenics and Malthusianism. Because guys, 100 years ago, eugenics and Malthusianism was not socially abhorrent. It was the norm. It was the follow the science of the day. You need to understand this, okay? So, so Havelock Ellis, this crazy, sexually pornographic degenerate, sleeps with Margaret Sanger, influences her uprising. Okay, Havelock Ellis's first mentor was a man named Francis Galton. Francis Galton coined the term today known as eugenics. Eugenics, properly defined, is the gradual suppression and elimination of those the society deems unfit, unfit to live. So Francis Galton came up with the term eugenics, and he was the singular biggest influence on Havelock Ellis, who was the singular biggest influence on Margaret Sanger. Okay, want to know who Francis Galton's first cousin was? Charles Darwin. <laughs> Evolution, the survival of the fittest. We're all just animals. We're, we have no more value than the dog or the cat. And so animal kingdom madness, the strong kill the weak, and might makes right. It's just the science, you stupid deplorables. <laughs> Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, coins the term eugenics, is the mentor of Havelock Ellis, who's the Alfred Kinsey of England, who's the bed partner and single biggest influence on Margaret Sanger. Whoa. Wow. The founder of Pine Barrenhead. She comes back to England, launches a brilliant public relations campaign to drop the charges against her, does a national speaking tour around the country, and launches her American Birth Control Review in 1970. It was a review, it was a publication. You publish all kind of, you know, pieces. So she would decide who would write in her review, what kind of ideas they were articulating. Okay, so then she launches the American Birth Control League, the organization, in 1921. American Birth Control League, later renamed Planned Parenthood. And Margaret Sanger explained how important birth control was in her movement. You need to understand, Margaret Sanger viewed birth control as a necessary political partner to eugenics. So listen, I'm not here to like cause a fury in this church today by saying any form of birth control is bad. The Catholics believe that. It's actually an interesting reason why Catholics have a position against birth control. Come talk to me afterwards. It's fascinating. I'm not here to say all forms of birth control are evil. I'm just saying, isn't it interesting that the founder of Planned Parenthood viewed birth control as the necessary political partner of eugenics aims? Here's what she said. Eugenics without birth control seems to us a house built upon the sands. It is at the mercy of the rising streams of the unfit. So what did Sanger begin to do? Propagandize birth control in major black neighborhoods, Hispanics, Slavs, Italians, and those she deemed unfit to live, those she didn't want reproducing. 
She explained her goals and passions in her book, The Pivot of Civilization. Here's what she said. She longed for when, quote, the choking human undergrowth of morons and imbeciles would be segregated and sterilized. I'm, these are quotes from her book. I'm not, I'm not just like coming up with stuff to make you hate her. Like she wrote all of these things. And she, she wrote, she, her great aspiration was this, from the pivot of civilization in 1922, to create a race of thoroughbreds by encouraging more children from the fit and less from the unfit. Now you see why we made her look like a demon. Because she was. Okay. As she put it in a speech at the 1921 International Eugenics Congress in New York, the most urgent problem today is how to limit and discourage the overfertility of the mentally and physically defective. Anyone disturbed? Do we, do we have barf bags? Are we handing those around? Is everyone okay? Okay, all right. Um, as she put it at her 1925 International Neo-Malthusian Birth Control Conference at the Hotel McAlpin in 1925. Oh, right. Neo-Malthusian Birth Control Conference. Why would you call your conference that unless you saw those two things as the same? Neo-Malthusianism, some people are good, some people are bad, too many people, we got to get rid of the people we don't like. Birth control, yeah, because they, they were needed to accomplish the same goals. Here's how they put it at their conference in 1925. The dullard, the gawk, the numbskull, the simpleton, the weakling, and the scatterbrain are amongst us in overshadowing numbers, <laughs> intermarrying, breeding, <laughs> and inordinately prolific, literally threatening to overwhelm the world with their useless and terrifying git. <laughs> Sanger put that conference on in 1925 in New York City. And then remember that Neo-Malthusian line of getting rid of private charities? Because it's, it's, it's seeking to love the people we just kind of want to necessarily perish. Well, Sanger would literally toe that Malthusian line directly by saying, organized charity is the symptom of a malignant social disease. We won't do the whole quote, but she says, these dangers inherent in the very idea of humanitarianism and altruism, dangers which have today produced their full harvest of human waste. All right, you guys ready for the racism now? Got 1939, Sanger launches something called the Negro Project. Hmm, I wonder why she'd call it that, guys. Okay. Well, here's what the Negro Project proposal asserted. You can find, we have like the, the original documentation from the American Birth Control League for their Negro Project. Here was the proposal. The mass of Negroes, particularly in the South, still breed carelessly and disastrously with the result that the increase among Negroes, even more than among whites, is from that pop portion of the population least intelligent and fit. So what was the goal? If that was the problem, what was the goal of the Negro Project? The gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extinction of defective stocks. Those human weeds which threaten the blossoming of the finest flowers of American civilization. <laughs> what a bigoted demon! <laughs> When they mean finest flowers, they mean rich white people. And when they mean defective stocks and human, human weeds, they mean Jews, Slavs, blacks, Italians, and the physically and mentally defective. Okay. Sanger wrote in her autobiography the wonderful time she had speaking at the women's branch of the Ku Klux Klan. I'm not joking. Go get her autobiography. She writes about it. Here's what she said. Always to me, any roused group was a good group. Yeah, yeah, the KKK was roused. <laughs> okay. And therefore, I accepted an invitation to talk to the women's branch of the Ku Klux Klan. My address that night had to be in the most elementary terms. In the end, through simple illustrations, I believe I had accomplished my purpose. A dozen invitations to speak to similar groups were proffered. So she may have spoken at other KKK rallies because she said other groups <laughs> were offered, but that's the only one she wrote about. Okay, so then the Negro Project would get black ministers involved to propagandize birth control, and they had field directors of the Negro Project to accomplish their goals in communities. Okay, so here's a couple of quotes from Negro Project directors. Women, Margaret, men or women, Margaret Sanger hired to be field directors in local communities. Okay, you ready for this? Here's what one Negro Project director said. There is a great danger that we will fail because the Negroes think that this is a plan for their extermination. Hence, let's appear to let the colored run it. In other words, they're telling you our racist, demonic, eugenic aims are a little bit too obvious and blatant. 
So we need to deal with that fact by just putting black faces at the front of the project so that other black people, will, we can waylay their concerns and they'll feel more comfortable. How is that any different today than Planned Parenthood who put 79% of their surgical abortion facilities in majority black neighborhoods and hires black people at the front desk so that the other black people that they want to eliminate will feel more comfortable because someone looks just like them! 1939, Negro Project, same goal. Here is what another Negro Project director said. Excuse me, okay, this is racist language. I wonder if Southern darkies can ever be entrusted with a clinic. Our experience causes us to doubt their ability to work, except under white supervision. That was one of the directors, field directors, of the Negro Project, which was Margaret Sanger's brainchild. So listen, when you hear people like Charlie Kirk and Michael Knowles and Tucker Carlson and Glenn Beck say, hey, the abortion thing, like it's kind of like a racist thing. That's not just like a Republican talking point to get more views on Fox News. I'm giving you the history behind why people say things like that. Unbelievable. So Margaret's dream was being fulfilled. And here was her dream discouraging the defective and diseased elements of humanity from their reckless and irresponsible swarming and spawning. That's why we label her a racist, okay? Now, you know a man or woman by his friends, right? Bad company corrupts good character. Here's just a couple vignettes because I'm going long as I always tend to do. Lothrop Stoddard was a board member of the American Birth Control League, Sanger's organization. Lothrop Stoddard was a high official of the Massachusetts Ku Klux Klan. He wrote a book called The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. Lothrop Stoddard wrote another book called The Rise of the Underman. And the Nazi Party's chief racial theorist, Alfred Rosenberg, appropriated the term Untermensch from the German version of Lothrop Stoddard's book. In other words, Underman is translated in German to Untermensch, also defined as subhuman and the term used to describe the Jews and the title of Heinrich Himmler's Nazi propaganda book. He was a board member for Singer. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, getting very carried away, I always do. Leon Whitney, Leon Whitney wrote in the Birth Control Review a piece called Selective Sterilization, which praised the Nazi party's pre-Holocaust race purification programs. So, you know, Sanger, she identified people she wanted to write in her birth control review. Do you understand this? So the people she's inviting to write in her review, she approves of their message. She believes what they believe. Madison Grant, a Sanger BFF and ally, was involved with the American Eugenics Society. And they shared the same office building. Okay. Madison Grant once put a black man in a cage with a monkey at the New York City Bronx Zoo to illustrate evolution. That man, Oda Benga, took his life 10 years later. Leon Whitney once got a letter from a, a German corporal rising in the German political scene, writing fan mail to Leon Whitney for his writings on eugenics. And Leon Whitney took that letter to Madison Grant to show off this. He was so excited that his writing was influencing eugenics policy in Germany. And Madison Grant smiled and chuckled and pulled out his own letter he had just received from the same German corporal, corporal recently out of prison, rising in the German political scene, calling Madison Grant's book his Bible. The man who wrote those letters was named Adolf Hitler. And Hitler would later attribute much of his eugenics policy in Nazi Germany to the writings, laws implemented by American eugenicists in America who were all sharing office spaces and sometimes helped sit on the board of Margaret Sanger's American Birth Control League, later renamed Planned Parenthood. She published a man named Ernst Rudin in her review. Ernst Rudin, at the time of writing for Sanger, was none other than the Nazi Party's director of genetic sterilization. Okay. A hundred years ago, following the science meant being a eugenicist. You need to understand this wasn't just in Germany, this had dominated American society. 
from Harvard to Princeton to Nobel Prize winning scientists to the American Museum of History to Supreme Court justices, eugenics was just the inevitable arc of the moral universe bending towards justice. Just the inevitable track of progressivism. So much so that Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, ever heard of that Supreme Court justice? A political progressive and eugenics advocate who wrote the majority opinion Buck versus Bell a 1927 court opinion, 8-1, upholding Virginia's sterilization law. And Oliver Wendell Holmes summed up the science in that majority opinion by saying three generations of imbeciles are enough. Hmm. Within 10 years, you had laws mandating the sterilization of those considered a threat to the gene pool. Alcohols, alcoholics, criminals, immigrants, and African Americans passed in 32 different states. One of the only Christians to see all of this and decry it publicly, like a Pastor Jurgen and a Pastor Jack Hibbs and a Pastor Rob McCoy was a man named G.K. Chesterton. I call him the first lib-triggering troll. <laughs> no, really, he really was. Before Ronald Reagan and before Trump, <laughs> he was the true first lib-triggering troll because he saw it all. He knew what we didn't, how these ideas had weaved their way through the fabric of the country, had been planted in the soil of the republic, and the nasty weeds and fruit that were birthed because of the abdication of the church. Chesterton saw it all. And he was immune to those don't be political, just preach the gospel attacks <laughs> from pious, self-righteous Christians who thought themselves too holy for the dirty business of politics. And so... G.K. Chesterton would define this eugenic attack on the Imago Dei and our Savior by saying, if Darwinism was the doctrine of the survival of the fittest, then eugenics was the doctrine of the survival of the nastiest. Because who's alive with eugenics? Some of the nastiest human beings you could think of. Ooh, Jews? Black people? Oh, that guy has a limp over there. We should probably snip him and keep him from having babies. This is what eugenicists believe. And Chesterton saw it all. He referred to the eugenic, the eugenicists of his day, the way we should refer to the abortophilic eugenicists of our day. And Chesterton said, they combine a hardening of the heart with a sympathetic softening of the head. Because he recognized what stupid ideas these were. Because as soon as you separate human dignity and human value from the human being, and being human is no longer enough to have value, dignity, and rights, then the elite, the pontiffs of progressivism, they get to decide the litmus test for personhood. Who gets to live and who gets to die? And what qualities are valuable to the community that we should encourage or discourage? Chesterton in 1920, guys, predicted 1973. Roe versus Wade. In 1920, he saw where this was going, and he said, one year before Sanger even launched the American Birth Control League, he said, we are not so far away from even the sacrifice of babies, if not to a crocodile, at least to a creed. If we don't all start becoming like Chesterton's right now in this Kairos moment, our children and our grandchildren will be paying the price for our cowardice, our political abdication, our spiritual abdication, and the spirit of Lot that has ruined the church in America. Brothers and sisters, we must always take sides. There is no such thing as moral neutrality. If you stand in the middle of the road, you will be run over by a truck. What if the church had heeded the warnings of G.K. Chesterton? What if Christians had cared more about righteousness and the plight of their neighbors than their own comfort and reputation? What if God's people had awakened and realized that the culture war was just a proxy war for the spiritual war? But we buried the evil, didn't we? We convinced ourselves that Christianity had nothing to do with politics. We wanted a place at the table. We wanted people to like Christianity. We didn't want to be reviled. But in burying that evil, brothers and sisters, we implanted it. Which is why Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the survivor of the Russian gulags, would later say, in keeping silent about evil and burying it so deep within us that no sign of it appeared on the surface, 
we were implanting it. And it would rise up a thousandfold in the future. And boy, did it ever. The rights and liberties we abandoned today will be the rights and liberties our grandchildren never knew existed. To quote my pastor, Rob McCoy, we're not demanding our rights. We're exercising our responsibility. And do you know who understood this? were a few brave 20-somethings in Nazi Germany in 1942. Her name was Sophie Scholl. His name was Hans Scholl. And Sophie had dreams of becoming a school teacher. And she loved the Lord. And she came across a leaflet on the sidewalk one day called Leaflets of the White Rose. And she picked it up and started reading it. <sighs> It was explicitly calling out the crimes of the Nazis and asking the good people to wake up. Her heart is stirred to action. She wants to join the White Rose Resistance. Guess what she found out later that day? She's like, some of this sounds like my brother. It had been being run and co-founded by none other than her older brother, Hans Scholl. So you can imagine Sophie's surprise, right? Uh, bro! <laughs> You're like super cool, like the White Rose Resistance, you're calling out the Nazis, telling the church to wake up. But do you understand Hans was trying to protect his little sister? Hans knew at, tw at 24 years old that what he was doing was so dangerous and illegal, it would likely forfeit his life, and it did. But Sophie said, I, I want a part of that. So for the rest of 1942, the White Rose Resistance in Munich area Germany began to write and distribute anti-Nazi leaflets all around Germany. They would take trains in the middle of the night to a major German cities and drop these things off. It was the social media strategy of its day. To put it there in the public eye for people to see, to say, wake up, do you see what's happening? And the White Rose Resistance guys was unique because they weren't just complaining and moaning that bad people do bad things. They understood human nature. They knew this was the norm. They were saying, where are you? And they would write in their leaflets of the white rose. They would say, we are the white rose resistance. We are your bad conscience, and we will not leave you alone. They said, if you know, why do you not act? And on February 18th, 1943, they took things to the next level. And Hans and Sophie walked onto the campus at the University of Munich during class time when the halls were quiet. And they started dropping off hundreds of these piles of leaflets in the foyer on the university campus to say, wake up, students. Wake up, lovers of Christ. Wake up, lovers of liberty. Do you see what's happening? They're killing the Jews. The janitor caught Sophie in the act because, you see, she went to the third floor balcony and she tossed an entire stack of pamphlets down to the atrium below. Now, what happens when you throw paper? It goes everywhere. <laughs> they had them arrested on the spot, were interrogated and physically assaulted, arrested on February 18th, 1943. And so they, they missed a meeting they had that afternoon that they were supposed to show up to with a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer who had caught the bravery of what they were doing. They never made that meeting with Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Four days later, on February 22nd, 1943, they were taken to the guillotine. These 20-somethings 20, these 20 spoke with a level of moral and spiritual clarity that transcended the pulpits of Germany. It was, if, it was as, as if God took Sophie in the palm of his hands in those last four days and condensed her entire life of energy into four days. And her cellmate, Elsie Gebel, who survived the Holocaust, was later able to write letters to Hans and Sophie's parents explaining every final moment of Sophie's life in that prison cell. Her courage and calm so disturbed her prison guards that the prison guards relaxed the rules and allowed Hans and Sophie to meet with their parents in a private room minutes, minutes before being taken to the guillotine. And Sophie's mom would look at her doomed daughter and say, remember Jesus, Sophie. And do you know what Sophie said? Yes, but you too, mama. 
And Elsie would later tell Sophie's parents that during those four days in prison, Sophie wasn't so concerned with her impending death, but she was wrought in spirit as to how her mother could handle losing two children on the same day. The prison guard was later interviewed by Christians, and he said, she went without the flicker of an eyelash. None of us understood how this was possible. The executioner said that he had never seen someone meet his end as she did. And when she stood before that kangaroo court and was sentenced to death for merely standing for the truth with the spirit of Jonathan and the lion of the tribe of Judah roaring in her chest, she would look at those Nazi demonic degenerates and she would say, someone had to make a start. What we wrote and said is also believed by many others. They just don't dare express themselves as we do. That has been why we are here today. The church and Christians who knew better, who believed the truth and sometimes spoke the truth, were like Lot and they weren't willing to die for the truth. And in her final moments, she would explain to her cellmate Elsie, why we got to this position in Germany. And it's why we're almost in the same position now. Here's what a 21-year-old lover of Jesus had to say. The real damage is caused by all of those millions who just want to survive. Those honest men that just want to be left in peace. Those who don't want their little lives disturbed by anything bigger than themselves. Those with no sides and no causes. Those who won't take measure of their own strength for fear of antagonizing their own weaknesses. Those who don't like to make waves or enemies. Those for whom freedom, honor, truth, and principle. It's just words and literature. Those who live small, die small. Right? It's the reductionistic approach to life. Because if you keep it small, you'll keep it under control. If you don't make any noise, the boogeyman won't find you. The IRS, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI. But it's all an illusion because they die too. Those people, those people who roll up their spirits into tiny little balls so as to be safe. Safe from what, Christian? Life is always on the edge of death. Narrow streets lead to the same place as wide avenues. And a little candle burns itself out just like the flaming torch does. But I choose my own way to burn. Who speaks like that at 21 years old? I'll tell you, a young woman with the spirit of Jonathan, a young woman with the lion of the tribe of Judah roaring inside of her, a young woman who understood that the culture war was just a proxy war for the spiritual war, that these were attacks against the sovereignty of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who entered human history in a uterus to identify with you at your most vulnerable stage. So that if you repent and believe, you will be saved and be used to accomplish miracles on this world and earth at a Kairos moment when everyone else was flinching. And so her final recorded words were to look out of her window before being taken to the guillotine and say, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there's hardly anyone willing to give themselves up individually to a righteous cause. Such a fine sunny day, and I have to go now. But what does my death matter if through us, thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? They never saw the army of resistance awaken because the good people chose to be like Lot and not Jonathan. Brothers and sisters, I am rebuilding the white rose resistance for this generation against our silent but more deadly holocaust of abortion to accomplish their goals and water the seeds of resistance and pull out the weeds of the bad ideas that the Satan and Lord of Flies and his followers 
were more committed to planning in the culture than the Christians were to pulling out those ideas and loving their neighbors. 65 million babies have been murdered since 1973 because of the ideology of Margaret Sanger and Leon Whitney and Madison Grant and Ernst Rudin and Havelock Ellis and Francis Galton and Charles Darwin who saw themselves to be as gods and that they were their own deity. If you can't preach against that Christian, what can you preach against? We think Sophie is brave and courageous because she sacrificed far more with far less freedom to stand against her Holocaust than we've ever done to stand against our Holocaust. And I'm telling you here this morning, I am a fly in the ointment, a stick in the eye, a pain in the butt to the abortion industrial complex and the spirit of the age and his obsession with killing babies. If you want to check out what we're doing and join the White Rose resistance, you can check out our website at thewhiterose.life. I will not rest until I need full-time security around my home every night because of the problem that I am to these abortion Philip, you Genesis murderers, wiping out the image of God in the womb. Brothers and sisters, I love you. I will see you on the battlefield. Now go out there and give them heaven and remind them of the lover of life and the creator of life who laid down his life so that you might be forgiven and redeemed. And if you don't know that savior who became a fetus to love you, welcome home, repent and believe for the gospel is for all. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.